Namaste. So today I want to go through a core concept of Advaita, and that is the distinction between existing and non-existing. You know, either it is or it isn't. That's how come the title, it is, is, what ain't, ain't. <laughs> so, um, of course, it's a little deeper than that, um, but that's really the essence of it. So we're going to go through uh, Bhagavad Gita 216 verse, and then we're going to read Shankara's commentary on the verse and analyze it uh, according to Sankhya philosophy, which is actually the philosophy of Bhagavad Gita. And uh, we're going to go, we're going to use the traditional style of Sanskrit uh, tutelage which is a call and response. And uh, because I have a guest here today, we can show you, we can demonstrate, and you should follow along too. And you'll see it very much increases the comprehension of the Sanskrit verse. It kind of, the sound vibration carries its meaning automatically. And so when you hear and repeat, especially these Sanskrit words, you get deeper understanding. You'll see how this works. Okay, here we go. Om Nasato Nasato Vidyate Vidyate Bhavo Bhavo Nasato Vidyate Bhavo Nasato Vidyate Bhavo Na bhavo, na bhavo, vidyate, vidyate, sataha, sataha. Na bhavo, vidyate, sataha, na bhavo, vidyate, sataha. Now the whole first line. Na sato vidyate bhavo, na bhavo vidyate sataha. Na sato vidyate bhavo, na bhavo vidyate sataha. Okay, second line. Ubayor, ubayor, api, api, drishto, drishto, antas, antas. Ubayor, api, drishto, antas. Ubayo abidus tontas Tvana Trana Ayu Ayu Tatva Tatva Darshi Bihi Darshi Bihi Tvana yos Tatva Darshi Bihi Tvana yos Tatva Darshi Bihi Ah, get it? Whole second line now. Okay. Ubhayo api drishtom tas tvana yos tatva darshi bihi. Ubhayo api drishtom tas tvana yos tatva darshi bihi. Got it. Now we're going to do the whole verse, okay. both lines, oh three times. Three times? Nasato vidyate bhavo na bhavo vidyate sataha. Nasato vidyate bhavo na bhavo vidyate sataha. Ubhayor api drishton tas tvanayos tatva darshi bihi. Ubhayor api drishton tas tvanayos tatva darshi bihi. Now this second drishto. Drishto. See the tongue was in the bottom of the mouth okay. as if you have a stone in your mouth. Oh, okay. Drishto. Drishto. Yeah, like okay. Krishna. Uh -huh. right? Krishna. It's the same kind of pronunciation. That's how you distinguish the the letters with the dot underneath okay. from the plain one. Uh -huh. Like it would be drishton if it was normal without dots, huh? Okay. But with the dots, it's drishton. Okay. Right. Ubhayor api drishton tas tvanayos tatva darshi bihi. Ubhayor api drishton tas tvanayos tatva darshi bihi. I'm gonna give you a rock and put it in your mouth. <laughs> Okay. Nasato vidyate bhavo na bhavo vidyate sataha. Nasato vidyate bhavo 
Nasato vidyate bhavo na bhavo vidyate sataha. Nasato vidyate bhavo na bhavo vidyate sataha. Ubhayo rapi drushton tas tvanayos tatva darshibihi. Ubhayo rapi drushton tas tarayos tatva darshibihi. Yeah, you see how your pronunciation yeah, improved with the getting, repetition? It's getting improved, yeah. yeah. There is no endurance of the non-existent. There is no change in the eternal. Seers of the truth concluded this by studying the natures of both. So I'm going to say you repeat. Okay. There is no endurance of the non-existent. There is no endurance of the non-existent. There is no change in the eternal. There is no change in the eternal. Seers of the truth concluded this Seers of the truth concluded this by studying the natures of both. By studying the natures of both. Okay. Okay. Now, na, na, never, never, okay. asataha, asataha, of the non-existent, of the non-existent, vidyate, vidyate, there is, there is, bhavaha, bhavaha, endurance, endurance, na, never. <laughs> na, na, never, never. Abhavaha, abhavaha, changing quality, changing quality. Vidyate, vidyate, there is, there is. Sataha, sataha, of the eternal, of the eternal. Ubhayo, ubhayo, verily, verily. Drushtaha, drushtaha, observe, observe. Antaha, antaha, conclusion, conclusion. Tu. To indeed, indeed, anayoho, anayoho, of both, of both, tatva, tatva, of the truth, of the truth, darshibihi, darshibihi, by the seers, by the seers. Well, let me read this translation one more time. There is no endurance of the non-existent. There is no change in the eternal. Seers of the truth concluded this by studying the natures of both. So now I'm going to read Shankaracharya's commentary on this verse, and uh, I'm going to put it on the screen at the same time so you can read along. There is no bhava, no being, no existence of the asat, unreal, such as heat and cold, as well as their causes. Heat, cold, etc., and the causes thereof which are perceived through the organs of perception are not absolutely real because they are effects or changes and every change is temporary. For instance, no objective form such as an earthen pot presented to consciousness by the eye proves to be real because it is not perceived apart from clay. So what does this mean? It means that clay is one of the causes of the pot. It's the material from which the pot is made. Then the potter putting the clay on the wheel and turning it and forming and shaping it into a pot is another cause. And then after the pot exists for some time, of course, it gets old and used up and eventually it breaks and it's thrown away. And then it's not a pot anymore because it doesn't serve the purpose of a pot, which is to hold liquids and things. But it's clay. So the clay is present before the pot exists. The clay is the ingredient, the material of the pot while it exists. And the clay remains after the pot is broken and absorbed back into the earth. In other words, the clay is permanent. 
and at least from the view of the pot. <laughs> and the pot is temporary because it's an effect. It's a change. In the beginning, it was just a lump of clay, then it was formed into a pot, then it broke and changed its form again. But the whole time the clay was there. Now, of course, this is a metaphor. This is an example. What he's really talking about is Brahman. Brahman is the existent. Sat. Because A, it's eternal, and B, it never changes. So both these are described in the verse. There is no change in the eternal. So you want to know what is eternal? That which never changes. And, you know, every time I check, which is quite often, my consciousness is still there. It's always there, even during deep sleep. See, we're not unconscious during sleep. We're just conscious of nothing. We are disconnected from the senses and mind. We don't perceive the world around us. Uh, that's only in waking consciousness. And in dream consciousness, we perceive a, a fictitious world created by the mind. Well, actually, the so-called real world is like that, too. Why? Because it changes. Anything that changes can't be fully real, just like the pot. See, the clay changes from one form into another, but the clay remains the same whether it's wet or dry, or in the form in the ground, or in the form of a pot, or in the form of a broken pot, or whatever. Clay is still clay. Similarly, Brahman remains the same without change, even though the material world, the phenomenal world, comes into existence, stays for some time, and then disappears. So what is real? <laughs> Only Brahman. Only the subjective, pure awareness. Even consciousness changes, isn't it? Every day we go from waking to dreaming, to deep sleep, to dreaming, to waking, to, you know? And of course, the objects of consciousness are changing all the time, many times a second. So how can we say that these things really exist? We can't. Because, you know, if you think of the whole life of the universe, what are your billions and billions of years, right? And uh, a single human life, maximum 100 years, is like nothing. So that person, that being, or that object that we perceive with our consciousness did not exist for billions and billions of years, then it exists for a short time, and then again, it does not exist for a long, long time. So we can say that you know, mainly it does not exist. It appears to exist while it is the object of our senses. But see, that's a game that the senses are playing too, because of name and form. They give meaning to objects that don't really possess it, you know? So I could say, this pot is an ancient Chinese Ming Dynasty antique. Oh, oops, crash, <laughs> right? It changed. Yeah. Now it's not an antique, it's not nothing, it's useless, worthless, yeah. throw it out, see? So we add these labels, Ming Dynasty, antique, you know, fine glaze, artwork, this, that, to increase the apparent value of the thing. But like all things, it's simply temporary. Uh, we can't get past that. That's just the way it is. So we can't really say that the material world or the objects within it, including our own bodies and minds, exist. So what really exists? Not even consciousness, but only Brahman, only pure, unconditioned awareness, which can't change. It never changes. It's always there. Even if we're aware of nothing, see? 
So Ramana Maharshi was famous for saying, you can't see the self, you can only be the self. See? So don't go around looking for the self or don't go into meditation and try to see Brahman. You can't see Brahman. You are Brahman. You're the seer, the witness. You're not the doer. You're just a bystander watching as life goes by. Everything is already done. It's, it's been created from the beginning as a complete whole, including all of what we call time, which of course, from a higher dimension is, you know, just part of the layout, just part of the landscape, huh? just part of the way the whole thing is built. But we identify with the body. And then when the body changes in time, you say, oh, I'm a kid. Oh, I'm a teenager. Oh, I'm grown up now. I'm getting middle-aged. Oh, now I'm old. Now I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> but these are changes. Yeah. And because they're changes, they're temporary. And because they're temporary, they're unreal. See, the real, the absolute Brahman never changes. So let me continue. <laughs> with Shankara's amazing purport. Thus, every effect is unreal because it is not perceived as distinct from its cause. Every effect, such as a pot, is unreal also because it is not perceived before its production and after its destruction. And likewise, the cause, such as clay, is unreal because it is not perceived apart from its cause, the earth element. So the pot only exists because the earth element exists and the clay only exists because the earth element exists. So apart from those causes, the pot has no existence, even though it's temporary. Huh? We don't perceive it when it's in the form of just clay in the ground. You don't perceive a pot only after it's shaped and formed and has the labels added to it. <laughs> then we perceive, oh, that's a pot. Huh? But then when it breaks and goes away, again, we don't see it as a pot. We see it as garbage, throw it out, <laughs> get rid of it. Huh? So this is the uh, final word. And it's interesting that this comes right in the beginning of Bhagavad Gita. This is like the first instruction that Krishna gives Arjuna in Bhagavad Gita. Arjuna is suffering from confusion or ignorance and grief. In other words, he's anticipating losing his relatives in the fight. So he's hesitating. He doesn't want to do his duty. He doesn't want to fight. And Krishna is trying to teach him try to enlighten him actually, bring him to self-realization. So he's not suffering anymore. That's really the ultimate thing Krishna wants to give. So what is the very first instruction he gives? It's, it's like the very last instruction, <laughs> the ultimate instruction. None of this is real, Arjuna. This is just a play, you know? It's just a bunch of temporary changes. Don't get hung up on it. See, Arjun is suffering from what? Grief and loss and confusion, ignorance like that. So Krishna just like wipes all that out with one stroke when he says that none of these things are real because your, your so-called relatives, right? Uh, <laughs> Even they're not real. Yeah. There's nothing and none of this is real because it all comes to existence at a certain point exists for a while and then goes away. So then somebody will, some wise guy is going to say, but wait, then because everything is either a cause or an effect, it comes to this, nothing at all exists. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is the argument of the nihilists or nihilists, oh. depending on whether you're speaking American or British English. <laughs> So the, I'm an American, so I can get away with saying the nihilists <laughs> think that ultimately nothing exists. It's all illusion, yeah. right? That everything which is perceived 
Indeed, everything which is perceptible has to be an illusion because it's an effect, right? Sometimes the causes are also visible, especially if we analyze things with our intelligence. We come to see or perceive the causes and effect relationships through the mind. This is important for later because it turns out the mind or the intellect actually is the only way we can actually perceive Brahman. So this is the point. Brahman is neither a cause nor an effect. Brahman does nothing. It's not a cause, you see, because Brahman has no boundaries, no distinctions. So if we had to distinguish Brahman as either a cause or an effect, you know, take your pick, either one, we would have to put a barrier, a distinction in Brahman and say, well, this Brahman is a cause and this Brahman is the effect, right? And actually we do that. That's why we're in illusion <laughs> because actually we are perceiving nothing but Brahman. Why? because we are Brahman. <laughs> and Brahman is the awareness behind our consciousness, which sees these three different states, waking, dreaming, and sleeping. So actually we perceive Brahman in the fact that we perceive ourselves to exist. I am. See, Descartes got it backwards. I think, therefore, I am. No, I am. Therefore, I think. <laughs> I make projections. I make overlays. I make superimpositions on Brahman. And I imagine that there are distinctions in Brahman, like the distinction between cause and effect, between existing and non-existing, between this and that, you know, right and wrong, black and white, in and out, up and down, whatever. True and false, existent and non-existent. See, this is our Aristotelian logic, <laughs> our wonderful Aristotelian logic, which has no category for that which is beyond itself. That's why the Jain logic is so much better because the Jain logic says something could be right or it could be wrong. It could be true or it could be false or it could be both true and false or it could be neither true nor false, but transcendental, okay. inexplicable, incomprehensible. Yeah unthinkable, unspeakable, see, indeterminate. And this is how Einstein discovered relativity. In his tensor calculus, he added a third logic value for indeterminate or undetermined or indeterminable, uh, that which cannot be resolved into either true or false, right or wrong, yes or no, one or zero, see. So that's what's missing in computers. And that's why computers are so damn frustratingly stupid yeah. because they're based on pure binary logic, which cannot explain the way the world actually is. So of course they're gonna fail and they're gonna make all kinds of dumb mistakes. You know, That's just the way computers, computers are. So, okay, nothing that is either a cause or effect exists, nothing that changes actually exists. But Brahman, <laughs> Brahman is beyond cause and effect, existence and non-existence. None of those terms apply to it. Huh? Or call it God or call it Nirvana or whatever you want to call it, doesn't matter. The same calculus applies. And this is the calculus of the absolute, uh, the mathematics of Brahman. So anyway, let's go on. <laughs> Shankaracharya continues, no such objection applies for every fact of experience involves twofold consciousness, buddhi, the consciousness of the real, sat, and the consciousness of the unreal, asa. Now that is said to be real of which our consciousness never fails and that to be unreal of which our consciousness fails. 
Thus, the distinction of reality and unreality depends on our consciousness. See? Consciousness is everything. Consciousness is the thing that everything's existence and reality depends upon. But consciousness changes. <laughs> it changes at, at the very least from Jagrat to Swapna to Sushupti and back again every single day for every body, even the animals. So everyone is experiencing all these states of consciousness all at once. And not only that, they're experiencing it through Turiya consciousness. And Turiya consciousness never changes. That's why it's equated with self-realization. If you're in Turiya, you're aware that you're aware of your awareness. See? Or more specifically, you are always aware of your consciousness. And you are always aware of being conscious. Even though you may be conscious of nothing in Sushupti. It doesn't matter. You're still conscious. And Buddha had a wonderful term for this. Neither perception nor non-perception. When there's nothing to be aware of, when you're in emptiness, when you're in the void in Sushupti, there's no way to determine whether you're conscious or not. See? Why? Because there's nothing to perceive. There are no impressions. There are no uh, experiences, no objects in Sushupti. Because Sushupti is pure cause. See? It's never the effect. And to have a perception, you have to be the effect. You have to let the senses affect you. See? So that's Svapna, or a Jagrat consciousness, where the perceptions, either of the mind or the senses, well, the mind is one of the senses, affect us, see? And we can feel the effect, even in a dream. Uh, last night I was dreaming about tigers. Tigers? <laughs> okay. Yeah, I was dreaming about being in this, um, I guess it was sort of like a zoo, uh -huh. you know? Not really, but something like that. Anyway, there were all these animals around. Uh, and they, uh, there were two, especially tigers. One, one little baby tiger, uh -huh. really cute, you know? Uh -huh. And then I guess it was the mother okay. tiger, the big... You know, tigers can get huge. Yeah. They can get like nine feet, ten feet long. Yeah. Um, I saw one in a zoo in India one time, and I was amazed. This thing was like 12 feet long. Okay. <laughs> Seriously? Yeah, and not including the tail. What? It was enormous. Well, they have it in this small cage, and it just lays around all day. It doesn't do anything, you know. It doesn't get any exercise, so it's big and fat, you know. <laughs> they probably give it drugs to keep it calm, you know. Because <clears throat> he was just as placid as could be. Well, the animals in this dream weren't like that. They weren't drugged or overfed. They were like lean and mean, right? Beautiful animals. And uh, what was it? There was somebody else in the dream, like a, a small child. And somehow or other, he was in the enclosure with the tigers. And I had to get him out. <laughs> That's my job, right? <laughs> to rescue all these silly children who've got themselves somehow in the cage of the tigers. <laughs> So anyway, I had to, uh, had to open the door, and then the, the, the door was open, the kid comes out, and then the door gets stuck on this animal's uh -huh. tail, uh -huh. uh, like a dog or something like that. It was like in the way of the door, and I couldn't close the I door. Did. <laughs> and I was like, uh oh, you know, the tigers are going to get out. But they didn't. They were just, they were cool, you know. Thank they you. just looked at this like... Oh, um, you know, these humans, <laughs> you know how cats are, Yeah. right? Either they love you or they don't care about you at all, <laughs> right? So uh, tiger love can be tough love sometimes. Anyway, our real nature is Brahman. And the proof is that every time we look, we find Brahman is there. Thus... The distinction of reality and unreality depends on consciousness. 
So to continue, now in all our experience, twofold consciousness arises with reference to one and the same substratum as a cloth exists, a pot exists, an elephant exists, not as in the expression a blue lotus and so on, everywhere. This makes reference to a Vedic example, well-known Vedic example, that uh, between a substantive and an additive, and, or an attributive. <laughs> this is Sanskrit grammar, you know, sorry, you just have to put up with this, because the source is Sanskrit. An attributive is like an adjective that modifies a substantive, which is a thing, okay? So if you say the elephant exists, or let's continue using the example of the pot because it's so handy and well-known. The pot exists. There are two things there, pot and existing. But if we say a blue lotus, See, there's nothing in that that's real. There's nothing in that that's existent. It's just a concept. A blue is an attributive or a modifier, an adjective modifying lotus. Lotus is the so-called substantive, but we haven't given it any quality of existence, you see? We haven't said the blue lotus is something or other. But we're not attributing existence to it. But in the other examples where we say the pot exists, there's a pot. The pot is on the table. See, we are attributing existence to the pot. And in our normal everyday lives, we do this habitually to everything that we encounter through the senses. It's just an assumption. Oh yeah, that exists, isn't it? And this is why people intuitively reject the truth of uh, non-existence of temporary objects. They say, well, sure it exists. I perceive it. Isn't it? This is the common way of thinking. And Advaita, the truth of Advaita, seems counterintuitive to them because they attribute existence to their experience. Yeah. <laughs> But anyway, where is this existence actually coming from? Brahman. Well, it has to, because only Brahman really exists. So, since we are Brahman, aham brahmasmi, right? Brahman is radiating this light. And we talked about this in a recent uh, episode of the uh, Upanishad. Kata Upanishad that the light of Brahman is existence because nothing exists without it. See, Brahman is the root, the source, the foundation, the substratum of consciousness. So because Brahman is always the substrate, Brahman is radiating the light that allows other things to exist without consciousness. You know, if a tree falls in the forest, right? Did it really happen? It's debatable. Yeah. That, that problem, that philosophical problem is insoluble. See? Because they don't accept the primacy, the, the absolute quality of consciousness as giving everything else existence. Without consciousness, as far as we're concerned, it doesn't exist, really. And, and the, you know, the news and what people tell us, this is all hearsay. We don't really know that it exists until we encounter it ourselves, isn't it? That's why people are skeptical. That's why people are cynical. That's why they uh, automatically argue against the truths of Advaita. Because they think, oh, I perceive it, therefore it must be real. No, because even your perception, even your consciousness is unreal because it changes. But they're not aware of the part of themselves that doesn't change, the Brahma, the pure awareness. And why is that? Well, Ramana Maharshi calls it the 10th man problem. This was a party of 10 men traveling and they have to cross a swift river. 
And of course, you know, there's a danger that someone could be swept away and drowned. So when they get to the other side, the leader counts the men in the party and he finds there's only nine. And he says, no, I must have made a mistake. And he did it again and there's still only nine. And then he says, hey, you, and he gets one of the guys to count and he also comes up with nine. So what's going on, right? Where did, are they missing one guy? It doesn't seem like it, you know? Nobody's hollering for help from the river. So then a wise man comes and <laughs> they say to the wise man, how many of us are here? You count. He counts 10. And they're going, how did we miss? And the wise man said, you dumbass, you didn't count yourself. See? They were each counting one, two, three, four, seven, eight, nine, and oh. forgetting, oh, I'm the tenth man. See, that's where that expression, the tenth man, comes from. It's a literary expression. Anyway, we discount ourselves, our real self, because our real self cannot be perceived. Remember, Ramana said, you can not see the self. You can only be the self. There's no way you can perceive the self because the self is the perceiver. I mean, I guess you could look in the mirror, but what mirror can reflect pure consciousness? And the answer is everything. The pure consciousness is the light of Brahman, the pure awareness, I should say, because it doesn't have an object. It just shines unlimitedly. <laughs> Right? Yeah. And because of that, because our Brahman is present within us, that it shines out from within the heart, from and it reflects on things beginning with the mind. Beginning with the mind and then down through the chakras and all the senses and sense objects owe their apparent existence to the reflection of Brahman. Remember we talked about that back in Drig Drishya Vivekaha. <laughs> Remember? Two years ago or something now. My God. Anyway, <clears throat> Drig Drishya means the seer and the seen. So we are the seer. We're not the seen. We can't be seen. But the light of Brahman is reflected in the apparent reality of the object. So all consciousness is twofold. See? Consciousness of the object and consciousness of the existence and the existence brahman's light is reflected in the object and makes the object appear to exist it's like you're in the dark and you have a flashlight yeah. the only way you can see anything is by turning on the light right but you can't see the light itself if you look at the flashlight it'll blind you completely yeah. especially in the dark so you keep the flashlight pointed out and uh, that illuminates all these different objects and you can find your way around. You can see that the snake is actually a rope and yeah. so on. So the same with the light of Brahman. And meditation means turning that light around and shining it on itself. Because Brahman can only be truly reflected in the mirror of Brahman. You see? So even the mind doesn't do a very good, even consciousness doesn't do a very good job of reflecting Brahman. But it's better than nothing. <laughs> it's better than being unaware that I am Brahman. As soon as you know that you are Brahman, Aham Brahmasmi, you can turn the mind, turn the intelligence, turn the consciousness on the source. And even though it's not a perfect reflection, it gradually reveals the real nature of Brahman, the real nature of reality. What exists and what doesn't exist. What is, is, and what ain't, ain't. And you see this, but you don't see it with these eyes. You see it with the eyes of intelligence. See, and that's why uh, Shankaracharya says, uh, actually later on in his commentary, that the fact that 
the objects in the world do not have real existence destroys all the authorities, parental, social, political, uh, religious, and even scriptural, even the Vedic authorities are destroyed because we know they came into existence at a certain point. They were, even if we accept the Veda's own version that the, they were emanated from the breathing of Mahavishnu, see? Even if we accept that, that is still a date in history, very, very early in the history of the universe. And before that date, they were not manifest. See, Brahma is born in the lotus flower that comes from the navel of Vishnu, and he's ignorant. He doesn't know anything. Who am I? Where am I? What is the going on here? Why am I here? What am I supposed to do? He doesn't know nothing, right? And he has to sit and do tapa. That's the word he hears in the, the uh, aerial voice. Tapa. So, okay, I get it. I have to sit down and meditate. So, you know, he's intelligent. He does it. He creates a big space in his mind to receive this big truth. And what is that truth? <laughs> Just happen to have this verse here. Ritertan yat pratiyeta na pratiyeta chatmani O Brahma, whatever appears to be of any value, if it is without relation to me, has no reality. Know it as my illusory energy, that reflection which appears to be in darkness. Nails it, right? This is from Srimad Bhagavatam, and it's spoken by Krishna or Vishnu as the voice of Brahman, uh, because he's authorized to do this by Shiva. He's authorized to speak with the voice of Shiva, Ishwara. He has a quality called Ishatvam. Ishatvam means existing as God, as Brahma. He can speak for Brahma. So before he does this, though, before he instructs Brahma, that doesn't exist, that truth doesn't exist in the universe. He only has the potential to manifest that truth. And it only comes into existence at the moment he speaks it to Brahma. So that's the origin of the Vedas. And because the Vedas have an origin, they are destroyed by the truth of Advaita. Once you realize Advaita, once you get this idea in your intelligence and you begin to see everything from it, I don't want to say through it because that would make it an object, but you see from it as a foundation, as an ontology. You see, using Advaita as an ontology, you see the world in those terms, in those categories. What you see is nothing really exists. It only appears to exist. Even the Vedas. I mean, we love the Vedas, right? <laughs> we're, we're lapping them up. We're, it's nectar. But they, we have to recognize, if, if you actually realize Advaita, why? You don't need any guidance anymore because you are Brahman. And you've always been Brahman. You always will be Brahman because it never changes. See? If it was, if self-realization would mean that you somehow become Brahman, that would mean you were not Brahman before. See? And that's just not possible. You can't take something temporary and <laughs> glue it to something permanent and it becomes permanent thereby. No. No, because these things are essential qualities. See? They are of the nature. That's why he uses the word tattva in the verse. Tattva, I, I should maybe go into some of these definitions a little better. Tattva really means uh, the 
22 or 24 or 27 or 32 or 36, depending on which school you, uh, you read, uh, tattvas or uh, prime substances of the creation, the materials. You see, Vishnu is the master of the materials. His Shakti is Lakshmi, who is all wealth, you see? And he says here, whatever appears to be valuable, whatever appears to be of any value, huh? anything that whatever is valuable, you see, it has to be part of Lakshmi, has to be part of wealth, because she is the Mahatattva, see? The Mahatattva, the, the all stuff out of which the universe is made. And Vishnu, after he instructs Brahma, gives Brahma authorization to work with it. Because now he has intelligence. Now he knows what's up. He has the Vedic wisdom. So he knows the game, right? And even if he has to, you know, get down into the details of, of this temporary existence and stuff to create it, and even if Vishnu has to get involved, deeply involved in karmic uh, work, to maintain it, still they know from the beginning, you know, they're realized. They have that Isha Tvam. Part of the Isha Tvam is having uh, infallible knowledge, self-realization. So they know, right? But others don't know. <laughs> Take Daksha, for example, Brahma's son, but, and one of the Prajapatis, one of the progenitors of the population of the universe. He had certainly heard these things from his father, but he didn't realize them. That's why he got into trouble with Shiva. Uh -huh. <laughs> he didn't invite Shiva to his sacrifice and Uma, his daughter. So, you know, those who don't get it will continue to act like Daksha to try to attain self-realization, right? And see, we're speaking now from the Ajata platform, right? We're speaking now from the eternal platform. And from the eternal platform, those who are striving for self-realization, even those in Vivartavada, in Raja Yoga, huh, seem to be a little nuts. They're obsessed with this process of becoming, trying to become Brahman. And, and that's impossible. That's ridiculous, right? <laughs> so we all have a good laugh at those guys. <laughs> but then we try to help them. Uh, and and uh, Ramana Maharshi also mentions this somewhere in his extensive materials, that the last disease is the obsession with attainment of enlightenment. Why? You're already Brahman. You just have to recognize it. The difficulty is in our intelligence. Our intelligence does not want to accept, especially the mind and the ego, don't want to accept this truth. It's easily available. It's an open secret. It's right out there in the Upanishads and in Vedanta. You know, anybody who reads them with an unbiased mind can immediately see, oh, okay, this is a difference between absolute and relative, right? Good old Einstein didn't call his theory relativity for nothing. See, Einstein was so smart. God, he's one of my heroes. He snuck in the consciousness and the absolute and all of that in the back door of the math through this indeterminate variable, this third logic value that everything is relative to the observer. And who is the observer? Conscious entity. And what is every conscious entity? Brahman covered by some Upadis, that's all. Even God. God is simply Brahman covered by the Upadi of Ishatva. We are Brahman covered by the Upadi of Jivatva. Those who are born. We think we were born. But we're Brahman, which is never born. So which is it, you know? Which do you choose to be? Well, 
If you choose to be Brahman, that's the end of suffering. It's also the end of birth and death. It's also the end of so many cherished illusions. <laughs> like I am this body, these are my family, this is my country, I am this, the so-and-so of such and such, whatever titles and designations and labels we have, you know. Uh, I am Mr. So-and-so and, -so and da -da 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 -da, the whole story. What was that one? I was born on a mountaintop in the Black Hills of South Dakota and his name was Rocky Raccoon, <laughs> right? This whole story, song and dance is a show. And what about, what is it about shows? Like Prince said it, parties weren't meant to last. <laughs> You know, they're not meant to last. They're artificial. Yeah. They're fabricated. Yeah. They're created. They're uh, manifested by someone. But actually, Brahman doesn't do anything. Try to understand. Shiva even, Sada Shiva, doesn't really do anything. Just by showing up, the universe comes into being around him. He doesn't do anything. In that sense, see, Brahman is never the doer. What to speak of the owner or the, you know, the, the maker or the recipient of karma, you know, either the creator or the recipient, cause or the effect or whatever, because Brahman is absolute. Brahman is dimensionless. Brahman is infinite. Brahman is unbounded. Okay. Brahman is even superior or senior to space because space is something perceptible in yes. Sushupti. So you see, any way you slice it, <laughs> this material world is unreal. So our consciousness is twofold. We find the twofold consciousness arising with reference to one and the same substratum, even though one of the two objects corresponding to the twofold consciousness is unreal. As, for instance, in the case of a mirage, where our consciousness takes the form, this is water. But on investigation, no actual water is found. Therefore, there is no existence of the unreal, the fictitious, such as the body and the pairs of opposites, or of their causes. Neither does the real self, the Atma, ever cease to exist. For, as already pointed out, our consciousness of the self never fails. By golly, every time I go looking to see whether I exist, I do. <laughs> and wherever I go, there I am. <laughs> <laughs> this conclusion, that the real is ever existent and the unreal is never existent, regarding the self and the non-self, the real and the unreal, is always present before the minds of those who attend only to truth, to the real nature of Brahman, the absolute, the all. That, see, Brahman, the perceiver, is this. We don't call it I. The Upanishads don't call it I because that word commonly in common parlance indicates the false ego, who I think I am or what I think I am. Whereas this says, you know, I am the observer, I'm the seer, I'm not the doer, I'm simply here. So then the apparent universe and Brahman, which is reflected in it as existence, is that. When we say that, we're pointing to something in the world, but we are doing it with the realization that it's only reflecting the existence potency of Brahma as light. And that's how we perceive things. So he concludes, you should therefore follow the view of such truth seers, shake off grief and delusion, and being confident that all phenomena are really non-existent and are, like the mirage, mere false appearances, calmly bear heat and cold and other pairs of opposites, of which some are constant and others inconstant in their production of pleasure or pain. 
<laughs> he's so smart. I mean, it took me like, I don't know, five or six readings to really get this. I'm just, you know, I'm not very smart. I'm just an ordinary person. The only thing is I never give up. So I've been studying this stuff my whole life and somehow, you know, it's gotten pounded into my head. But anyway, he's saying here that, okay, once you know this or once you grasp it, once you grok it, you become it instantly and you see with the eyes of Brahma. So if you realize that none of the stuff that changes is real, then you can bear things like heat and cold, honor and dishonor, fame and infamy, uh, being right or being wrong, being smart or being stupid. You don't care because you know what you are and you know what the game is. And this uh, like uncovers the role of Maya or illusion in existence. And as soon as you do that, you're no longer subject to Maya. You're no longer subject to karma. You're no longer subject to birth and death. You're no longer subject to suffering. Because what, what is it that suffers? It's only the mind and body, and that's not you. You're just a watcher. Around whom, because you're Brahman, huh? around you the whole creation comes into being because you illuminate it with the rays of your existence potency. And it reflects those rays. So now some things like heat and cold. Sometimes heat or cold feel good. Uh, like on a hot day, you take a cold bath. Oh, it feels so good, right? Or the other, on a cold day, you take a hot bath and it feels good. But if you take a hot bath on a hot day, you're uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Same with a cold bath on a cold day. So these things are variable in their production of pleasure or pain. See, pleasure or pain is simply a judgment we make according to our condition or according to the bodily condition, right? Or mental condition. Uh, I think it's good to be f uh, famous or popular, let's say. Uh, let's go back to high school days. Oh, yeah, it's good to be popular. The more friends you have, the better, right? That is perceived as pleasurable in that state of mind. But if you're in a state of meditating, and you want to like steal your mind and focus it on Brahma, then to have a lot of people around is a big distraction. You want to withdraw from society. You want to be uh, solitary, right? So that you have the space in your mind for really big ideas. And that's the secret. That's the key to learning all this stuff, realizing it. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Shakti Aum. Aum Namah Shivaya.